And I titled the message, What Does Love Look Like? Um, now, in chapter 12, Paul was teaching the church in Corinth about spiritual gifts and the purpose of the gifts, which is for the building up of the body of Christ. In verse 7 of chapter 12, Paul said, But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. And so the purpose behind the use of spiritual gifts is not for my benefit, um, but for the benefit of others, as God wants to use my life as a conduit uh, to reveal himself and his love uh, to others. Now, the church in Corinth had a good understanding of the gifts of the Spirit. In fact, Paul said of them back in chapter 1, verse 7, that they came short in no gift. But where they did come terribly short in was in the area of Christian love. As, um, and thus, they were using the gifts and doing their works of service with the wrong motivation. Um, and, you know, the, the church in Corinth was a boastful church. Uh, they were prideful. They, were, they boasted in human wisdom. They boasted in the use of their gifts. But they were missing the point behind it all, which is love and the only motivation that God will accept and that will profit the believer is love. And this is the subject Paul dealt with here in chapter 13. So, all right, well, look at me at verse 1. Paul said, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. Now, the ability to speak in tongues uh, was a gift of the Spirit one of the gifts of the Spirit. And this was a, was a gift that was much sought after um, and um, desired in the church of Corinth. And so Paul begins here um, in order to show them that the use of this gift, which was prized so highly, if it's used without love, it profits nothing. As he said, it's like a sounding brass, a clanging cymbal. And in saying this, he compared it to paganism. Um, as in the New Testament times, pagan deities were honored through all different kinds of noises and hypnotic chants as the worshipers of these various gods would work themselves into a frenzy and they would use things like clanging cymbals and gongs. You know, they still see that today in some of the uh, restaurants and pl places of worship, you know, the banging of the gong and whatnot. They'd use these things in their rituals. And so the Corinthians, as they read these words from Paul, no doubt got the point that the use of the gift of tongues, if it's used without love for God and love for others in the church, really was no better than a pagan ritual that only amounts to empty noise. Empty noise. Um, this gift has been misunderstood by many um, in the modern church. And it's been misused and abused by many. Um, there's a way to use this in a way that's profitable and that's edifying and that's right. And Paul's going to get into the rules in the next chapter. Um, but it's got to be governed by God's way. Governed by love. And when, you, when things are governed by love, things will be done in order. Not out of order. Disorder is the result of selfishness. Uh, you know, when you got a bunch of people trying to bring attention to themselves, you're going to have disorder. Um, but when you walk in love, it's a whole different matter. And so Paul here has compared it to that. All right, look at verse 2. Paul went on and he said, And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. Wow. So Paul here mentioned three gifts. Uh, the gift of prophecy, knowledge, and the gift of faith. All right, well, let's start with prophecy. Now, prophecy, Paul is going to say in the next chapter, is the greatest of all the gifts. And the reason for that is because through prophecy, God's truth is proclaimed to the people so that they can know it, understand it, and then apply it to their lives, which is the greatest need that people have, to know and understand God's word and then to live it out. You know that's the greatest need you have, to understand the word of God and then to live it out? 
You know, Solomon said in, his, in, his book, in the book of Ecclesiastes, he said, after going through all the things of life that a person could attain, whether it's wealth, riches, pleasure, power, he said, it's all vanity. And he said, what's the conclusion of the matter? Let's, let's hear the conclusion. He said, it's this, fear God and keep his commandments. This is man's all. That's what it's all about. The fear of the Lord and the keeping of his word. And so this, that's why this gift is so important. But with that being said, Paul said here that even though this gift is so important, if it is used without love as the motivating factor, he said, I'm nothing. It's nothing. You know? um, and what a rebuke to the Corinthians you know, who were boasting in the gifts. Boasting in talent, boasting again in human wisdom and all these other things. If you don't have love, you're nothing. You know? Now, let me give you an example from the Old Testament of a prophet who misused his office. You might remember him. His name was Balaam. We've looked at him on Wednesday nights as we've gone when we were going through the book of Numbers. Now, Balaam was a prophet who spoke much truth on behalf of God. Uh, but Balaam had no love for God or for God's people. And he wanted to curse the Israelites for the king of Moab so that he could get paid. <laughs> that was what he was after. But you remember, God restrained Balaam from putting a curse on the Israelites. But Balaam, because he was driven by his greed, he found another way to bring a curse on Israel. And he did so by helping the king of Balak to lead them into idolatry and sexual sin. And because of this, Balaam was eventually put to death. But the interesting thing about Balaam is that in spite of all of this, he had the gift of prophecy. Balaam knew the word of God. He spoke the word of God. He even feared God in a self-preserving kind of a way, but he had no love for God, and thus his ministry was a failure and profited nothing. And that's a stark example. That's quite a vivid example of it. You know, when something's not motivated, by love. You know, you can know truth, but if you don't have love in your heart for it, or for the God of all truth, it profits you nothing. Now, Paul, in stark contrast to Balaam, is an example of one who ministered and used the gift of prophecy in love. He said in, he said in the book of Acts chapter 20 that he kept back nothing that was helpful in his preaching and his teaching, regardless of great personal cost as he suffered by those who plotted against him for his faithful preaching of the gospel. You know, he could say this to the elders there in Ephesus. He said, I am free from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. He kept back nothing. He said that he served the Lord there and with all humility and even with tears. In the book of Romans, chapter 9, verse 2 and 3, Paul said this concerning the Jews, most of whom rejected Christ and the message he preached. He said, I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh. Paul ministered in love. He was burdened for the people. Paul said this in 2 Corinthians 5.14, For the love of Christ compels us. That's what made all the difference. And that is always what makes the difference between service for God that is profitable and service for God that is not. Now, Paul also mentioned knowledge and faith here in verse 2. As he said, of knowledge there in verse 2, the second part of verse 2. He said, and though I understand all mysteries and all knowledge, <laughs> um, though I have all faith that I could even remove mountains, see great things accomplished for God, my faith was so steadfast. He said, but if I don't have love, I'm nothing. The supremacy of love the supremacy of love. Now, I want to also point this out. Paul wasn't knocking knowledge. Um, he wasn't knocking faith. <laughs> Two very important things. <laughs> knowledge and understanding are vital. But without love, they profit nothing. You remember Paul said back in chapter 8, knowledge, what's it do? It puffs up. But love edifies, builds up. 
But that doesn't mean that spiritual knowledge is not important, okay? Now, John MacArthur, I like what he said. He said, we cannot be edified by or, or obey what we do not know. <laughs> Jesus said that it is the truth of his word that sets people free. And so spiritual knowledge is essential. But the point Paul was making is that spiritual knowledge, even the highest attainments of it, if it's on its own, it's nothing. If I don't act upon what I know in loving obedience to God, it's nothing. You know, I could know it all. I could be, you know, the greatest theologian on the earth in my having all the degrees, you know, every, you know, the PhDs and all the master, the, the magna cum laude, everything behind my name. But if I don't have love for God and others, what does it really profit? Paul said nothing. Same with faith. You know. Verse 3, Paul said, And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. So even great acts of charity and self-sacrifice, if not motivated by love for God and others, are meaningless. As Paul said here, such things profit me nothing. The Protestant reformer Martin Luther, he learned this lesson. Martin Luther was a devout Catholic, performing many strenuous religious works, acts of penance, even to the point of physically abusing his body. But then he came to read those words from the Old Testament, quoted by the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 1, verse 17, that say this, the just shall live by faith. And you know, he was set free from all the meaningless religious works he was offering in an attempt to earn God's favor as he came to realize salvation is the gift of God. Given to those who simply believe in Jesus Christ and what he accomplished for them on the cross. As on the cross, Jesus made atonement for all of our sins. And you know, it was this truth from Scripture of justification by faith that brought Martin Luther from a legal relationship to God motivated by fear into a loving one. And it sparked the Protestant Reformation. I think that was pretty profitable. We're here today as a church because of it. <laughs> the difference between love and the other. Paul makes it clear here, listen, you could do it all, but if it's not motivated by love, if you don't, if you don't understand the truth, it doesn't profit you anything, you know? And I think it's important we understand that we can't earn God's love or favor. It's a gift. It's free. You know, that freely bestowed upon us through Jesus Christ, his finished work on the cross. You know? But when you come to understand that, and your burden of sin and guilt is taken away, then you're free to serve God in a profitable way, which is the way of love, the way of agape. And Paul, from verse 4 to 7, is going to go on to define love. And, in it, and the thing I want you to notice as we look at each factor of it, the emphasis that Paul gives is not so much on what love is, but on what it does and does not do. The emphasis is on action. You know. Now, the Greek word for love here is agape. And this is one of the rarest words in, in ancient Greek literature, uh, but yet one of the most common in the New Testament. And the reason for that is because the emphasis of most of the Bible is on God's agape love, which is something that is foreign and um, really misunderstood by the secular and unbelieving world. You know, most people today, and sadly even many Christians, when they think of love, they usually associate it with nice and warm feelings or with things like romance uh, and desire, you know, the Hallmark Channel. <laughs> so I had to take that shot for, at my wife and daughter over there <laughs> and my mom. <clears throat> John MacArthur, he said that most people, when they say, I love you, often mean, I love me and want you. 
And you know, that of course is not love, but it's just pure selfishness. But sadly today, that is so often what passes for love. You know, the world doesn't understand what love is at all. But Paul is going to show us here what love is like. What love is like. And agape love is a love that is primarily concerned with that of giving, not receiving. And God himself is the source and the fountain of this kind of love. In fact, John the Apostle declared in 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, God is love. It's one of God's chief attributes. And God, of course, demonstrated his love in sending his only begotten son into this sin-sick world to save it. And so look at verse 4. First thing Paul said about love, he said, Love suffers long and is kind. So love, first of all, is long-suffering or patient. It puts up with a lot. And it puts up with being wronged without seeking retribution or retaliating back. And Jesus demonstrated his long-suffering on the cross when he prayed for his enemies and said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The long-suffering of God. Incredible. Paul called the long-suffering and the forbearance of God, he said, the riches of it. The vastness of it, the wealth of it. We are here today sitting in this room because of the long-suffering of God. All of us. We're alive and well because of his long-suffering. For if God was not long-suffering, we would have been judged long ago. Paul said the riches of it. It's so rich. I live because of his long-suffering. Jeremiah said in the book of Lamentations, through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed. Great is your faithfulness. The long-suffering of God. It's long-suffering. It's kind, patient. Now the world doesn't understand that. You see, the world views things like vengeance and retaliation as the greatest virtues, not long-suffering and patience. And the world makes heroes out of those who fight back and stand up for their rights. But God's love being long-suffering does the opposite of that. And the world often looks on with contempt, misunderstands it, and even misinterprets it for weakness or indifference. You know, there was a famous atheist in the 1800s named Robert Ingersoll who would often stop in the middle of one of his lectures against God and say, I'll give God five minutes to strike me dead for the things I've said. And he would use the fact that he was not struck dead as proof that God did not exist. But you know, I like what a gentleman by the name of Theodore Parker said of this claim. He said, and did the gentleman think he could exhaust the patience of the eternal God in five minutes? (laughs) It's pretty good. You know, the thing that the world does not understand is that it takes much greater strength to patiently bear with wrongdoing and evil than it does to retaliate immediately against it. The strength of God. You know, how easy it is to just retaliate when you're wronged, right? That's the easiest thing in the world to do. But to not retaliate, that's strength. That's love. We read of Jesus that when he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he didn't threaten, but he committed himself to the Father who judges righteously. When he was before Herod being mocked, he opened not his mouth. He said not a word. Didn't defend himself. The power of God's long-suffering and how it can break the enemies of God down and and how it can convert even people to Christ. Abraham Lincoln was someone who understood this principle. Let Let me read you an account from his life that beautifully illustrates the power of God's love and patience 
under wrongdoing and the results that came from it. Here, and I quote, one of Abraham Lincoln's earliest political enemies was Edwin M. Stanton. He called Lincoln a low cunning clown and the original gorilla. It was ridiculous for people to go to Africa to see a gorilla, he would say, when they could find one easily in Springfield, Illinois. Lincoln never responded to the slander. But when as president he needed a secretary of war, he chose Stanton. When his incredulous friends asked why, Lincoln replied, because he is the best man. Years later, as the, the slain president's body lay in state, Stanton looked into the coffin and said through his tears, there lies the greatest ruler of men the world has ever seen. His animosity was finally broken by Lincoln's long-suffering, non-retaliatory spirit. Patient love won out. <laughs> what an example. That's a great story. And it's a beautiful illustration of the power of long-suffering and kindness. You know? The Bible tells us that the purpose of God's long-suffering and goodness and forbearance is to lead you to repentance. Yeah. The Bible says that the long-suffering of the Lord is salvation. And so that's the chief, um, that's the beginning of it. It's long-suffering, it's kind. You know, I'm saved because of his long-suffering. That's why. That's why I'm here. All right, Paul went on and said, love does not envy. So it's not jealous of others or with the blessings and the good things that they have. Paul said, love does not parade itself, doesn't boast, doesn't brag, doesn't try to draw attention to itself. Paul said, it's not puffed up. It's not arrogant. Doesn't think too highly of itself. Verse 5, Paul said, does not behave rudely. It's good mannered. It's not careless. It's not insensitive or, or crude. <laughs> does not seek its own, Paul said. So it's not self-centered. Uh, but it's more concerned for the needs of others. Paul went on and said, listen to this one, is not provoked. Imagine that, not provoked, God's love. It's not aroused, it's not irritated, it's not upset, it's not angered by things that are said or done against it. It's not, a, it's not provoked. Can you imagine that? How easily provoked are we? <laughs> Yet God's love, not provoked. Paul said, it thinks no evil. And then this could also be translated, keeps no account of evil or keeps no record of wrongs done against it. So it forgives and it forgets. Verse 6, first part of verse 6, Paul said, does not rejoice in iniquity. So, love never takes pleasure in sin, whether that's our own sin or the sin of others. Doesn't rejoice when others fall. Doesn't rejoice when others fail. And doesn't rejoice over sin at all. But rather it mourns and it grieves over the sin and it seeks God's forgiveness and God's restoration. You know, we, Paul said to the Romans in chapter 8, God is, if God be for us, who could be against us? God is for you, you know. We so often view God as against us, <laughs> as if he's just waiting for us to fall, waiting for us to make a mistake so he can come down on us and pounce on us. But here we read that love doesn't rejoice in iniquity. God's not... Happy when you fail so he can punish you. <clears throat> Rather, he 
he weeps, he mourns, he grieves. He, he desires your restoration. He desires reconciliation. In fact, the Bible says he delights in mercy. God is a God who delights in mercy. He's just waiting for the opportunity to, to show it. If people will come to him for it. He doesn't rejoice in iniquity. <clears throat> you know, the Bible says that God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. But he'd rather wick, the wicked turn from his wicked way and live. That's God's heart. So love doesn't rejoice in iniquity. Second part, Paul said, but what does it do? It rejoices in the truth. <clears throat> love rejoices in the truth. And the truth here referred to is that of God's word. God's, and I want to point this out because this is important. God's love is always consistent with his truth. Know that. God's love is always consistent with his truth. And you know, there's nothing loving about holding back or denying any portion of God's revealed truth in the Bible, as many do today in the name of unity and not giving offense. But that is not love. Love rejoices in the truth. And Paul said to speak the truth in love. Truth has to be spoken. Jesus said the truth will set you free, not a lie. And any unity based upon a lie is not lasting and won't last. Because love rejoices in the truth. <clears throat> and you know, God's love rejoices in the, re God rejoices in the receiving of sinners. We saw that in the Gospels as Jesus sat and ate with the tax collectors and the harlots and the Pharisees were upset. Why, do you, why does he eat with them? Why is he with them? You know. But Jesus said, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Those who are well have no need of the physician, he said, but those who are sick. And we see this illustrated in the, prodigal of the, par of, uh, sorry, the parable of the prodigal son. As when the son came home, the father rejoiced at the receiving of his son back again from, from death to life. We read, Jesus told, tells us this in the Gospels, that all of heaven and the angels rejoice over one sinner who repents. Love rejoices in the truth. God rejoices when people come to the knowledge of the truth. And so should we. You know? Remember it was the elder brother who was mad that his younger brother had come home and been restored. He was bitter. He's like, why does he get the... Why, why are you killing the fatted calf for him? Look what he did, you know. He went out and, you know, spent, recklessly spent all that you gave him. But remember the father said, son, it was good. We had to rejoice for your brother was dead, but he's alive again. He was lost, but now he's found. Love rejoices in the truth. And when people come to the knowledge of the truth. Verse 7, Paul went on concerning God's agape love. He said, it bears all things. <laughs> wow. You know, it, it bears patiently with the faults of others and takes no pleasure in exposing them, but seeks to cover them. <clears throat> you know, God doesn't take pleasure in shaming people. You know, and neither should we. <clears throat> bears all things. Believes all things, Paul said. <laughs> now, that doesn't mean that love is naive or gullible. Okay, It's not that we close our eyes to the truth or the reality of what's going on. But rather, what's being said here is that love is not cynical. It's not suspicious. You know? But it gives the benefit of the doubt. And it isn't quick to accuse or find fault. It gives the benefit of the doubt. Believes all things. Right? Paul said, hopes all things. <laughs> John MacArthur said of love that when, um, when it runs out of faith, it holds on to hope. And as long as God's grace is operative, human failure is never final. <clears throat> Hope's all things. <clears throat> Jesus never gave up on Peter, did he? <clears throat> Even though Peter denied him three times. The Lord said, I've prayed for you, Peter, that your faith should not fail. <clears throat> Hope's all things. And so... It, hope, it holds on to the hope of God's grace even when the sinner strays so far away. And again, just like the father of the prodigal son, it never gives up the hope of the son's return. 
hope so. And finally, Paul said, there at the end of verse 7, endures all things. It refuses to quit. God's love refuses to quit. It endures everything. It endures it all. Verse 8 to 10, Paul said, love never fails. And this is why it, it is, must always have the supremacy. But then he goes on, now he goes on to talk about the gifts, right, that they were boasting in and placing so much emphasis on. He said, but whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. He goes on and he says, For we know in part, verse 9, and we prophesy in part. Verse 10, But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. What's Paul talking about here? Well, he's talking about the eternal state. When believers will forever be with the Lord, and when that day comes, prophecy, tongues, and all the spiritual knowledge attainable in this life will vanish, Paul said, away. It'll be gone. You won't need it anymore. <clears throat> you know, you won't need it anymore. Why? Because you'll be with Jesus. You'll be with Jesus. You'll see. Your faith will be sight. Your hope will be fulfilled. <clears throat> and all that will be left, as Paul's going to tell us, is love. <laughs> love for God and love for others that will go on for eternity. Verse 11 and 12, Paul said, When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I also am known. So, in this present life, even with the Bible and with the help of the Holy Spirit to understand it, still the believer's knowledge is limited. As Paul said, we see in a mirror dimly. We don't see completely yet. We don't see perfectly. It's, it's, our vision is clouded. <clears throat> and as long as we're in these bodies, that will always be the case. But when we go to be with the Lord and when we see Jesus face to face, then Paul said, I shall know. Just as I'm known. I'll know. John the Apostle said, When we see him, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. And Paul said that he's going to transform these lowly bodies to be just like his. Amen to that, huh? <clears throat> the older you get, the more you say amen to that. <laughs> And so Paul closed the chapter in verse 13 and said, And now abide faith, hope, love. These three. But the greatest of these is love. As I said, one day our faith will be sight. One day our hope will be fulfilled. But our love for God and each other, each other is something that will go on for all of eternity. And thus, that is why the greatest of these is love. And that being so, God's agape love should be the standard by which we judge our lives, by which we judge our actions, and by which we judge the service we offer to the Lord. Match it up to chapter 13 here. How you matching up? <laughs> now, some of you are thinking, I'm failing miserably, and I'm right there with you. <laughs> Nobody matches up to this. You know, you put, if you put your name into all those things, none of it matches up. I can't say, you know, verse 7, Daryl suffers long and is kind. Nope. <laughs> you know, Daryl doesn't envy. Nope. You know, Daryl doesn't pray to himself. Nope. Daryl's not puffed up. Nope. But when I put Jesus' name in there, <clears throat> it all matches up. And so we're pursuing him, and we're pursuing his love, and we're pursuing to be more like him. And that's the standard by which we must judge everything. 
Because as Paul said here and made it so clear, without love, I'm nothing. And so may we pursue his love and judge our lives according to it. Amen? Shall we pray? Lord, we thank you for your word. <clears throat> a lamp unto our feet, a light unto our path, Lord. And, and God, I pray that, Lord, these are some soul-searching um, verses in your word, Lord. They're very convicting. And truly, they show us the truth about ourselves, Lord, and, and how we fail. But Lord, <clears throat> we know that this is why you came, Lord. As, as you said in the Gospels, you said you came to seek and to save that which was lost. You came to call sinners to repentance. And Lord, we all need to repent constantly, daily. <clears throat> and this is why you went to the cross, Lord. Because we had a debt we could never pay, Lord. But you paid it in full because of your great love. And so, Lord, help us now as we prepare to take communion to Rightly judge ourselves, Lord. If we have any sins, Lord, may we confess them before you. May we get right before you and rejoice in what you've done for us. And it's in your precious name we pray. Lord Jesus, amen.